Well, let's go ahead and get started. This, is, this is, looks like a good crowd. <coughs> going to have a good time tonight. Thank you all for coming out to uh, Malvern Books tonight for Novel Night. I want to welcome you to hear uh, Joan, Myra, and Joy. And, uh, you know, this is you know, something really special I really look forward to. Uh, I think that uh, I need to tell you to eat snacks. We have a lot. We have our our famous uh, <coughs> St. Patrick's Day cupcakes out there. So please eat them. And uh, yeah, we have water and all kinds of other stuff. Another thing is that uh, for Novel Night, a special is that there's 20% off all fiction in the store. So uh, that's a uh, always a nice perk. So we have three readers tonight, which is great because usually we only have two for novel. Um, so our first reader is Joan Moran. Joan is the author of her humorous and incisive memoir, Sixty Sex and Tango, Confessions of a Beatnik Boomer. I'm the boss of me, stay sexy, smart and strong at any age, women obsessed, and her most recent novel, An Accidental Cuban. Joan? Thank you. Thank you all for coming, first thing. Thanks for friends and almost family in the room. Um, this book uh, is called An Accidental Cuban. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of passages from this book and uh, and then we're going to each read approximately 10 minutes, and then after that, you can ask us questions, which will be fun, uh, because the subjects of these books are so varied and incredibly interesting. Harry walked up to the small craft bus station in Cienfuegos before sunrise. He hadn't taken a bus in more than a year when he accompanied Kobe and Katrina to Santiago de Cuba to visit Satomi and William. It was a happy time. They were off on a seaside vacation, laughing and feeling the lightness of life. It was a different kind of happiness that morning he took the bus to La Habana. It was the happiness of hope. The station looked the same, run down but clean and appearing like it was open and ready for business. He bought a ticket from the unpleasant woman inside the ticket office. Dressed in a clean brown uniform, she barely looked up. But he sensed she hadn't left her seat since he last saw her. She would die in that seat. Three people lined up behind him, irritable Cubans, half asleep, half committed to the ride to La Habana. As he waited for the bus to arrive, the stillness of the early morning air was refreshing. In an hour, the humidity would rise and take his breath away. He settled in a window seat, ready to think about his pitch to Ishmael, trying not to get ahead of himself, staying present. Fatigue finally overtook him, and he was lulled to sleep by the motion of the bus. After a few hours, he awakened and felt some relief from the guilt of leaving Kobe and Pat Katrina. He had a mission, a small opportunity, one phone call to get a hearing with Ishmael in an urban city filled with people who suspect each other of trying to get the upper hand. He overheard conversations in the plaza, especially from Ernesto about black market crime in La Habana. State police were complicit, hiding in plain sight. The tourists didn't recognize the fear, but Cubans knew the island had another face. The bus station in La Habana was crowded, like all bus stations in Cuba, and looked like it hadn't been cleaned since the end of the revolution. <laughs> the smells of body odor and rank must hung in the air. <coughs> Harry smoothed out his shirt and made sure it was tucked into his pants. He noticed that most people, especially the women, were dressed in bright reds and greens, which gave off a festive air. But in contrast to Harry's gray shirt and black pants, the colors made him feel invisible. With trepidation, Harry approached the bathrooms and imagined that they would be worse than toilets in India. He checked the men's room but turned around as fast as a ballet dancer's pivot. The bus station was a place of contact, connection, and even social interaction. 
While locals were swirling around trying to get in or out of La Habana, tourists were trying to figure out how the system worked. The young hustlers were everywhere trying to entice anyone standing to take a taxi or a bus or a coca taxi. It was a three ring service. Harry heard of these coca taxi contraptions in Cienfuegos. They looked like auto rickshaws. A friendly driver approached him and Harry decided to take a ride. A policeman stopped the transaction because the driver had no license. Annoyed, Harry jumped out of the cab. Someone grabbed his arm. Oi, hombre, where are you going so fast? Don't you have time for your friends? Harry turned around, ready to face off with the voice, and saw Norm, Juan Juan's buddy in Cienfuegos. He was supposed to be a bartender at the San Risa, but he was rarely on the premises. Harry didn't know much about him, but he didn't trust him. Juan Juan's friends were always suspect. Harry pulled his arm off Norm. What the hell are you doing here? I haven't seen you forever. Don't get your boxers and knots, said Norm, just asking if you need a ride. Norm twitched, sniffed, blinked, and straightened his dirty clothes on his tall, skinny body. You surprise me, Harry said. Aren't you supposed to be pouring drinks at the San Risa? You're now independently wealthy and don't need money? <clears throat> Funny, he said without expression. No, I'm here for one one. We've got business in the big city. What kind of business? Following me kind of business? You might call it that. Norm lit a cigarette and blew the smoke out of the side of his mouth. You can tell Juan Juan I don't need a bodyguard, and you can leave me the fuck alone. Harry ditched Norm and Hope hopped into the nearest taxi and told the driver to stop at the edge of the bus station. He didn't want to waste money taking cabs. Besides, he wanted to get the feel of the city on his own. Outside the boundary of the station, the only entertainment in La Habana was watching a bus turning a corner or counting the number of ubiquitous Che Guevara images that plastered the town. Only the tourists wore Che t-shirts because it was the cool thing to do. Che and his pretentious black beret were iconic. But tourists knew nothing about the hierarchy or the history of Che and his relationship with Fidel. They saw the image of a handsome revolutionary romanticizing his exploits. Viva Cuba Libre. Visitors to Cuba didn't know that Che was only a stepping stone to Fidel's geopolitical game with the Soviet Union. Harry could recite Che's stories in his sleep. Every year, in every grade, he heard Che was the real revolutionary, as Fidel came more and more a politician after his pitiful ragtag army entered La Habana in 1959. Che was probably a better guerrilla fighter than a doctor, but he ended up doing Fidel's bidding as president of the Cuban bank. <clears throat> Harry never knew how Che talked his way out of being a banker, but probably appealing to Fidel that his real passion was exploring communism in, uh, sorry, was exporting communism to Zaire and the Congo. And Fidel went with that because Che was beginning to be a pain in the ass. In 1966, Che returned to Cuba and gathered a revolutionary army to replace the Bolivian government with Marxism. Che must have felt betrayed by Fidel when El Jefe didn't adequately supply him with men and materials to the mountains of Bolivia. Even so, Che never looked back. He was the real revolutionary. So that gives you a little setup of Harry getting into Havana. There's more as he begins to explore the city. So time passes, um, and um, Harry gets into the money exchange business the underground economy in, in Havana, um, which is just exploding and actually supports the government, the military government, because these, these, they find out you're doing business underground, you get taxed. Those taxes go to the government. That's how they get the money. So this is something that happened to Harry along the way in his exploring how to get off the island how to get money to finance his exit to freedom to the states. Night temperatures were cooling the city, humidity lifting. Three more days of mourning Fidel. Shops and restaurants were still closed, and people were staying home at night. As he passed the corner of Calle Barcelona, Habana Vieja felt menacing. Harry had a hard time keeping up with Ishmael. His legs felt like jello. Acid burned in his stomach, his lower back stung with pain. They walked past the Capitolo Nacional, freshly scrubbed for President Obama's visit. 
but empty inside due to repairs. The Spanish architecture looked as imposing as imposing as the U.S. Capitol on which it was modeled. As he caught a glimpse of Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes in the distance, flashes of the great Cuban artists brought into his, were brought into his mind. Colasso, Blanco, and his favorite, Raul Martinez, masters of 60s Cuban pop art. He remembered his mother who took him to the museum. It was the day his father left. They crisscrossed streets and found themselves on Paseo de Marti, a very long, wide boulevard with trees and benches, scrubbed almost clean of any black smudges left over from the past decades. Ishmael sat down on the bench under a bright, large, yellow moon. Harry kept walking. Fear made him oblivious to everything outside of himself. Harry, shouted Ishmael, get back here. Ishmael, angry and frustrated, searched for an internet connection. He stepped into the center of the boulevard and finally connected. Is he seated outside or inside, asked Ishmael. How many people are around him? Has he been served? Harry was pacing, running his hands through his hair. Okay, thanks. We'll get the thing timing right now. I'm not doing this, Ish. It has to be you. Victor knows you. Ibrahim is at Los Nardos watching the waiters and customers. Not many people in that restaurant. You'll walk up to him inside the restaurant and Victor will greet you with a fake smile or a shock because he thinks you've double-crossed him. Be fast when you come around to the back of the chair. Ismail took out a slim four-inch silver knife. The handle was carved into the image of Che. It looked like a kid's knife. Cut this into the palm of your hand. Keep the blade down until you burnish past him. <clears throat> no big moves. You want to cut the neck artery and he'll slowly bleed out. No one will know what happened for about 30 seconds. You'll be gone by then. This isn't who you are, Ish. It's not Ibrahim either. How the fuck did this happen? Ibrahim will walk in front of the table to, detect, to deflect attention. Victor's got two men with him. It will be too late to notice you've gone or that Ibrahim is part of it. Listen up, Harry. Ibrahim will look different. He's wearing a scarf, glasses, a dark wig. Victor's guys won't be able to trace him. But they'll trace me. I can't do this. I'm not cut out to be a killer. Out of the darkness, the businessman, briefcase in hand, walked past Harry and Ishmael. Harry turned away from the man, paralyzed with fear and paranoia. Even the trees had ears. Justin needs Victor out of the picture. He has our files and knows what our bids are. That's all we need to know. What about every other country that has applications on file with the government? Are you going to kill these men too? You had value to Justin and Charles when Victor put you on the payroll. If you didn't figure that out, you're not as smart as I think you are. What about Russian, the Russian government? They'll find out I'm a dead man. Victor's been sent by some <coughs> Russian oligarch. They'll be sniffing around when Victor doesn't call. The Russians send people to Cuba all the time, hoping they'll score some contacts. You throw enough shit on the wall and something will stick. Victor is expendable to his handler. We'll take care of the Russian follow-ups if that happens. Charles promised to give you $25,000 for this hit. That should make you feel better. Charles, $25,000 doing a hit? This happened to other guys. Guys with no brains, no moral compass, no potential. This was a simple inquiry. Change money, make money. Killers are the other guys. Not guys like him. Good looks, brains, tiger by the tail kind of a guy. But this is a killer's world. A world where money is made and men die. I won't do this, said Harry. No amount of money will make me do this. This is murder. Ishmael put one hand on Harry's chest, one hand over his mouth. You have no choice. Ishmael smoothed out Harry's shirt, and fixed his collar, like his personal valet. <clears throat> he locked eyes on him with animal intensity. You do this, Harry. You're in too deep. And Justin will tell you when you can leave the island. In fact, he'll give you a full ride out of La Habana, wife and daughter included, after he's done with you. Harry pulled at his collar, looked down at his shoes, and whispered, I don't know where the are.